it's on the hour. No, I think we can get going if it's okay with you. Okay, I'll introduce our speaker. So hi everybody, welcome to the seminar uh, of uh, uh, the civil and, and architectural engineering department. So today our speaker is Christopher Mayer. He is an assistant professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Miami. He's also the co-founding principal of the architectural firm Atelier May. So um, Chris is um, the director also of the Literal Urbanism Lab, the LU Lab, which operate as a knowledge gathering center and project-based design group and focusing on the evolving dialogue, binding architecture, urbanism, and the environment. So it's a great pleasure today to have Chris. Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I greatly appreciate making these connections between the School of Architecture and the College of Engineering. It's um, a wonderful bridge and we need to make sure we continue to, to build that bridge. So I, I greatly appreciate uh, the invitation and I'm excited to talk about the work. So I'm gonna kind of jump right in. The uh, lecture here to the, this um, afternoon is actually going to be trying to look uh, specifically at uh, the state of Florida and some of the advancing uh, conditions around um, uh, emergent construction techniques, specifically mass timber. Okay, so the, the basic question that we are asking in both the practice and in the Lou Lab is uh, how do we build? And so the story today is going to really start uh, with this image, the forest. And what we understand within both the practice and in the lab is that as we start to dictate and set forth both material agendas and processes of building, what we're really doing is setting forth a, uh, an agenda for territorial conditions. And that doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter what material we select, we're still working on those territorial implications. And so for us, we were trying to figure out what does the state of Florida have to offer? And actually it's uh, interesting for us that the state has a, a very large resource battery, which has been, uh, emerging and growing from the state of the wood basket. So what does that look like for us? We look at a Sankey diagram as saying, what does the state have in terms of a building resource in its own kind of boundaries or in its own perimeters, which is both renewable. Uh, we use the word sustainability um, sometimes too loosely, but in this instance, it's, it is a, a resource that could be a sustainable resource. Uh, and also something that is able to be grown, processed, manufactured, and utilized uh, all within a kind of a really small footprint or system boundary. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is kind of a start to finish thinking in some ways. I, I say start to finish. It broadens the perspective what starting and finishing looks like for a material agenda. So on the left-hand side, we see this timber stand as the starting point. On the right-hand side, the outputs. Those outputs can be, you know, dimensional lumber, pieces of uh, paper, or other kinds of things, boxes, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are coming out of uh, wood-based fibers in and around our region. So what is important for us though within the lab and in our practice is to look at two moments here and I'm going to zoom in on those in a second on the far left again that timber stand because as we start to uh, predicate and dictate uh, processes of construction and materials for construction we are pointing our fingers directly at the timber stand and asking it to do something specific uh, and then again as we are starting to uh, funnel those um, those raw material resources in and through processing and manufacturing what is it that we're asking of their output so on the right hand uh, box there the red dialogue box there it says paper goods insulation fibers etc and it moves way down there until you get to dimensional lumber or sawn timber or board. So when we zoom in on this, the timber stand being the kind of starting point, now that process is growing and shrinking um, and on a kind of an evolving basis across time. Right now, the timber stand in the southeastern region is growing at a faster rate than it's being uh, uh, harvested. And so from the uh, position of a, a, a material utilization, 
we see that it has a lot of potential. Now that potential is often misunderstood or misled. Uh, there are questions of energy and environment, water management, land management, carbon uh, questions that are all wrapped up inside of that timber stand as it grows and shrinks and we process and manufacture materials from it. But we know it's our starting point and by uh, dictating what processes and material sets we're going to use, we're actually in a way constructing or building that forest. So the other end of the spectrum, uh, oh, that slide's not coming across uh, specifically cleanly here, but what we're looking at is actually a moment for the paper goods and insulation and fiber, and this is really about pulp and processing. Uh, for those to kind of maybe shrink and move some of that material, that wood fiber, towards the dimensional lumber or uh, board production. And that is uh, specifically aimed at addressing our interest in uh, building products at the kind of larger scale used for structural elements. So just a kind of a quick look here. So mass timber is the point of discussion for this afternoon's talk. And we're going to have to kind of cut across the realities of what that means. Some people are aware of it, some people are unaware of it, so I want to be very clear. On the left-hand side, we're working with the Southern Yellow Pine Forest. That is actually uh, what I showed the image of uh, to start the presentation. Uh, we see those trees as very specific. That's Southern Yellow Pine is not a species, but a group of species uh, made up of uh, long leaf, short leaf, slash um, pine, and loblolly pine. Uh, so those, those particular four species make up most of what we're going to be extracting and harvesting. They clearly have uh, time uh, for growth patterns, certain fiber productions. They all carry their own energy and carbon story, but they are pretty close as a set of family members. Uh, so those, um, those timber stands, they get harvested. They're put into logs. We then see those logs be cut into dimensional lumber. And then uh, those dimensional lumber pieces for American-based um, blue lamb and CLT processing are then uh, reassembled into uh, cross laminated timber panels like you see on the far right. So if we keep that slide on the far right for one second as our output, we got to also think about the process that's lead up as that dimensional lumber is being uh, um, purchased and, and absorbed by these manufacturing facilities. On the left hand, and this all gets toward the permitting actually. This is interestingly enough, uh, this may seem a bit um, strange to start with, but it really is where the permitting and the uh, arrival of some of the answers for the state of Florida's acceptance of mass timber is going to come from. So on the left-hand side, we see that the material is both digitally scanned. It is then going through a human inspection. Uh, after those um, particular uh, inspections are done, that means that we've graded the material. We understand its structural properties. We can group and cluster it in terms of what its outputs are able to produce. We then see it um, organized into uh, dimensional number for CLT on that third slide from the left, and then ultimately arriving in a panel on the far right. Now, what is also important to keep in mind is that as that uh, visual inspection, digital inspection is happening, uh, there is still a process that kind of exists between those two center images. And that's where the material is, again, having to be uh, planed uh, down to a dimension so that the pores are opened up and the glues can work as the adhesion between members. Uh, and then also the uh, 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 application and then pressing of that uh, panel to make sure that it stays uh, laminated. And there are inspections along the way which are driven by the APA PRG 320 certification, um, which we'll start arriving to shortly. I wanna take a moment just to say, uh, the reason why this question exists for us within uh, both our practice and in the lab, specifically the lab, has to do with the state of Florida's uh, access to wood utilization uh, processes and ultimately the forest as a resource. Uh, half of our territory in the state of Florida is actually forested land that is productive for wood fiber. Now that wood fiber is going in a lot of different directions, pellets and paper and pulp and also dimensional lumber. So if we look at it within a larger context of the southeastern region, which is the slide on the far right hand side, what we see is that that wood basket is actually quite large. Now that forest is not homogenous across the entirety of the southeast, but in the southeastern region that includes, say, for instance, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, they, we have a pretty clear cross section of wood that's being grown for specific purposes, and that is this SYP forest. And so we're going to point at that as like the impetus why this information is important to study uh, here at the University of Florida's um, Lou Lab. Now, back, going back to the right-hand slide for a second. Yes, we are way down here in Miami. We are a long ways 
uh, from what most people think is uh, oftentimes America, but even more potentially the forest itself. But it's actually not that far. So Gainesville is kind of the the last little uh, bit of where the floor, the forest is expanded. Uh, so it's not actually the far away that we have access to a, a wood uh, resource. Now we're also not suggesting that every building in Florida or Fort Lauderdale or Palm Beach needs to be made in wood. But what, what we are trying to do is challenge the processes of wood building so that maybe we can rethink what it means to build healthy buildings in South Florida that are also uh, taking on both an energy and a carbon question. Uh, the other note uh, is that Dothan, Alabama is actually where we can see panels being constructed out of Southern Yellow Pine. So when we look at it as a system boundary, the forest is close, the state is uh, accessing that uh, resource. It is an economic engine, a pretty serious economic engine for the state. It is part of a, of a larger network. Uh, there are mills in Florida. There is interest in wood in Florida. It has a history of wood. The Florida Cracker House was the kind of impetus for building mass timber buildings way back in the day. And we have processing and we have interest globally from outside sources, both from Europe and Canada. All of those things suggest that it is time to study it and figure out what is going on. So some of the first things that we're trying to figure out are where is the infrastructure? So as we expand that map that was on the right-hand side a little bit more, and we look at the southeastern region, what we see is that Florida, uh, again, is a kind of complicated set of forces. Us down in Miami seems to be out of reach of the wood basket, but really we're not. Nine hours away from material processing is not that far, uh, relatively speaking, if we draw a system boundary. Specifically, when we look at the globe as our now resource basket, uh, what we'd like to do is kind of shrink that down if we can. Uh, but there are other manufacturing facilities that exist in the southeast. Um, for instance, Lufkin, Texas. We have one in Conway, Arkansas. Uh, there is one up near Chicago that is a little bit further away. Uh, and again, Dothan, nine, about nine hours from us here in South Florida. So we see that the infrastructure is there and it is growing. Actually, the Southeast is a point of economic expansion for a lot of these mass timber markets. Again, this is the impetus for why we think this is worth studying. So what is it that we're trying to understand? We're looking for a mass-based solid wood agenda for SYP material. Now, Florida gives us an interesting set of uh, processes and, and uh, forces to deal with, uh, but we are looking at that. So I often joke about this slide. If you don't believe we're looking at it, uh, clearly you can see us here looking around, searching for that set of questions. Now, this doesn't necessarily build the bridge of why Atelier May plus the Lulab are working on this in terms of a partnership. So again, I wear both of those kind of hats, if you will, Atelier May and Lulab, director of Lulab, co-founding principal of Atelier May with my partner. Uh, but the reason why they are two different entities is one of them belongs to an academic setting, Lu the Lulab. It ultimately is trying to use the infrastructure of the institution as a non-biased approach to study work from the position of education, dissemination of education, and also the research behind the scenes, understanding the policies and procedures that we need to address uh, specific sets of questions that are looking at it from a very, very uh, straightforward, factual way, which can often get colluded whenever we look at it from a practice standpoint. Even if the information is not being uh, corrupted by personal interest within practice-based scenarios, what we do see is it's hard to engage in policy because everybody on the policy side would ultimately think that practices has something to gain by this. So what the lab does is it helps us have an independent voice of uh, non-biased uh, research. What the practice does that the lab cannot is it implements, it applies these strategies of interest. We can position real projects in front of policymakers and permitting and ask them to look at it from the standpoint of realness. The lab is not really aimed at that. The lab is really aimed at the questions that come out of us positioning those projects in front of um, policymakers, permitting, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and to try to answer those from the, the manner in which um, the questions are being uh, delved out by the particular groups. All right, so clearly then the diagram makes sense. Research in academia, we have to advance these questions. We have to look at what the real questions are for mass timber uh, in a non-biased fashion, uh, looking for the facts. Uh, on the practice side, we're trying to work with the municipalities and the AHJs to really challenge what it is to, to be sustainable and to build buildings out of sustainable materials or grown or renewable materials. And then we bring all that information together and we try to share it all with the, the, the groups that are interested. You know, the U.S. Forestry Service, uh, both at state and national level, manufacturing, um, uh, 
design professionals, and, and all the way down to our students uh, who are emerging in this profession as leaders for how this uh, planet's going to be in a better position moving forward, not a worse one. All right, so I'm going to try to break down this uh, presentation in four parts. We're going to try to move through them swiftly. I know I, I have a limited amount of time. Uh, but you're going to see policy and kind of some of the history of where that comes from, from the state of Florida. We're going to look at some planning and logistics for mass timber buildings, some of the technical and tectonics of how one of the structures came to be in Miami-Dade County. And then we're going to end with the pretty pictures of architecture and space. Uh, hopefully that's a, a enticing enough to keep you guys um, focused for a bit of time with me. So policy and history. So Miami-Dade County uh, is a very complicated set of forces. It exists at this kind of gateway where hurricanes move across the Atlantic and kind of arrive to our, our coast and cause us to have to deal with some pretty extreme forces. All of that says is it drives some policy forward. Uh, it makes us have to respond to our buildings having a certain resilience. Everything there is understandable and agreeable. The question for mass timber, though, is can we build structures from cross-laminated timber panels in Florida, or particularly Miami-Dade County and Broward County, and I'll get to why that's important in a second. And the answer is yes, maybe, actually more importantly, how. For us in the lab, we're looking back at history and figuring out where some of these policies are coming from. Now, clearly 1992 was a really a complicated time frame. Now we are removed from that seemingly from most of the generation that's moving through school uh, right now in terms of the student body. Uh, but there are a lot of practitioners that still carry the residual, you know, kind of um, forces that uh, came with uh, Hurricane Andrew. It was very devastating. It was problematic. It was, it was also a massive storm at the time, uh, caused enormous amounts of uh, uh, devastation and economic and ecological um, catastrophe. But it really what it did is it caused uh, Miami-Dade County to address um, planning and policy and permitting. And so they really took that seriously and they said, we need to address our codes. So what happened was a Hurricane Andrew uh, really set forth this HVHZ or high velocity hurricane zone overlay for Miami-Dade County and Broward County. And out of that, what we find is two, three points of analysis that we feel like are something that the lab and the practice has to work on. Out of this shift in policy, what we found was that there was a comprehensive shift towards concrete and steel for single family residences through mid-rise buildings. And this is only to say that it carries with it large implications for energy, carbon, economics, um, you know, logistics, actually the amount of time a building uh, takes to build and also the amount of time a building needs to exist for it to balance out across its cycles. The other thing that it uh, produced was a commitment in a, in a set of single processes, meaning that everything was focused on this kind of comprehensive shift based on the, uh, the HVHZ overlay. It re required essentially uh, a focusing on a set of skill sets, which then had an implication of reducing that skill set down to a very specific uh, set. And so what we're finding is local trades actually lack a lot of diversity in their capacity to work with emergent materials or materials that exist outside of uh, the basic, you know, palette for Miami-Dade County and Broward County or the state of Florida in general, uh, which is typically CMU, uh, poured concrete, some basic steel. Uh, and so that actually made a very kind of narrowed uh, set of uh, interest. That narrow set of interest actually permeated its way through the planning and um, um, uh, zoning and, and also permitting, where if the only buildings that are being presented are buildings that are addressing the HV8Z in a very narrow window of material sets, then the knowledge sets that's kind of being developed and, and percolating in and through all of those administrative sectors is actually very limited, meaning that their knowledge is not necessarily broadened from having to evaluate novel solutions. The NOA process really caused that kind of limiting of exposure. Okay, so all of this is to say, well, why, what does that have to do with you know, mass timber and what, what, how do we communicate this and where is the educational outputs and how is this going to be important for Miami-Dade County and the state of Florida. So what we have to put forth really quickly is that the NOA or the Notice of Approval or Acceptance uh, is required for all building components in the HVHC overlay and is actually something that the state of Florida pushes towards to kind of get some baseline understanding about the materials that are being used in buildings. Now, the, the um, Essentially, what then happens is that there is no section in the HVHZ for mass timber, meaning that the local AHJs, the, you know, those authorities having jurisdiction, they don't have a path of acceptance uh, uh, for mass timber. So 
it actually puts all the uh, pressure on the process of the design team to find these paths forward in terms of equivalence. That was what our job was in the practice. The job what we had in terms of the LULAB, if we go back to the top of this slide for one second, is to understand this certification, the ANSI APA PRG 320 2019 compliant. I could go on. It just seems like we're rambling at that point, but that is how the CLT panel is being certified structurally. And when that certification exists, that was accepted and that was understood in some of the building codes. So we were kind of Kind of picking it apart to find that. And once we did, we had a means of talking with our planning and uh, permitting policy folks. And that was very exciting. So just to kind of look what that really means is that that standard is looking at panels, CLT panels that are made from at least three orthogonal layers of sawn lumber, sawn grade lumber um, that are laminated by uh, gluing or adhesives. There are other processes of making mass timber panels using nails, which will be NLT dowels or Brett Stoppel using uh, wood dowels that hold it all together or mass plywood, which is layers of really thin veneer that are stacked together with adhesives uh, and laid up into essentially a, a set that looks a lot like a mass timber panel, uh, but it's mass plywood. So what we're looking at here is CLT specifically, and that means that the glue layer is going to become one of these moments that's very important. Okay, so finding a path to equivalence, um, the uh, path to equivalence for us had to do with two areas of interest uh, from, this, from the position of HVAC zones. The first one was the large missile impact. We understand that uh, as being very um, important for us here in South Florida, uh, which we also probably, since it's an engineering group, you'll understand what that, that means. We're just firing two by fours at assemblies uh, with specific parameters. But the second one, which might lie a little bit outside of the normal seas for you guys, uh, is actually dealing with the wet dry wet dry cycle testing, uh, and that has to do with our, you know, basic plywoods or stuff like that that are going to be exposed to some weather, making sure that they don't delaminate or they can take a little bit of this water wet dry wet dry cycle before they delaminate. Now that um, in, that particularly was looking at essentially wood composites and lumber panels. This is not talking about mass timber. Now, the conditions, though, were really looking at how does this apply to mass timber, and that was the lens in which the local um, authorities were asking mass timber to address um, in terms of um, testing. So just quickly to go through how we got the mass timber through the large missile impact uh, test, which was the, uh, luckily, we were working with the U.S. Forestry Service and found that they had done in the past a, a missile impact for their work in terms of utilizing mass timber as a quick way to deploy um, housing, et cetera, in war zones. And so they were testing it based on literally missiles and, and explosive impacts. So that testing um, parameters had very specific testing criteria that we were then able to present to the uh, local authorities. And they were able to determine that the pressures that the panel was put under through this actual missile testing and explosion testing from the forestry service met or exceeded that of what was expected of the, the typical large missile impact resistance for the, the local conditions. Now that is already pre-existing and that was able to quickly um, kind of put out some of that uh, issue from the jurisdiction. But what wasn't able to um, really be accomplished really quickly was the wet dry, wet dry cycle testing. And this was the thing that held up the agreement and the acceptance of the material through the permitting. So after digging and digging and digging and having lots of conversations with the local authorities and from the standpoint of the LULAP, just saying, look, how do we, what, what, how can we ask and answer these questions for you in a way that gives you uh, confidence that it's addressing the needs of the test? And we found out that essentially what they were trying to accomplish was to uh, apply these kind of plywood based um, wet dry wet dry cycle testings to the wood in terms of its uh, capacity to hold up uh, through structural performance after being wet. Uh, that all sounds pretty simple and indeed it is, but CLT just isn't tested in that fashion. So CLT was tested at, you know, in um, essentially as an indoor closed environmental condition where it wasn't supposed to ever see water. It's not an external condition. It doesn't actually deal with those uh, forces from the environment from the outside. And so they don't really do those testing. And it's also not required in the rest of the country. So what we found though, was that in Canada, they had a standard for evaluating, um, uh, they had done some 
what was actually deemed as boil dry freeze treatments. And so we found that testing and we brought it to, to um, our group here and said, let's look at if this is uh, something that's also viable. And so through the boil dry freeze treatment, we were able to build some similarities or like a process of um, acceptance that was paralleling um, what they were requesting out of this uh, other wet dry cycle testing, which was based in the uh, Miami Dade checklist, you know, for those keeping notes, the 0475. Um, and so we were able to find some compliance there. But actually, what we had to do was look at uh, another team member. And that team member was actually the, the adhesives. And so what was uh, important for the local AHA was to say, they see the structural load moving through the, the, the wood across the adhesion line into another layer, meaning that the adhesion between those two was also in their mind, a structural question. And that was the delamination that they were asking for. And they were requesting that once it goes through this wet dry cycle testing, that it carried a specific performance criteria in terms of structural loading as a post cycle testing test. That was the test that was missing from the uh, CLT. We didn't have that post um, structural test. But what we did have was access to Hinkle um, in terms of their interest in this project. And they were able to give us some of those uh, parameters and we were able to find some commonalities uh, with the local AHJ. So when we are looking at what the um, Canadian standard was looking was doing, which was it was fully soaking um, the adhesion layer in water uh, and saturating it completely. It was also boiling and it was drying that. And then it was going back and looking at what its uh, delamination was. This was actually not a question of performance criteria for structural loading as much as it was based on just straight delamination. Were the pieces going to come apart? Now, the, the interest for uh, mass timber uh, within their, their assembly is that the wood typically fails before the glue will. So the glue line is typically much stronger than the actual grain within the wood. And so what we find is that the wood would actually shear or break within the fibers themselves that before the glue line would. This is why the performance in terms of the uh, delamination was um, looked at essentially from the Canadian standard is only a delamination while from the standpoint of the a, uh, HVHZ zone uh, AHJ, uh, they were looking at it from the perspective of structure. We were able to kind of bring those groups together um, by bringing Hinkle into the conversation. Hinkle, the glue manufacturer of most of the panels that were being produced out of one particular uh, um, plant, the Smart Lamp NA plant located in Dothan, Alabama, which I located on a map for you earlier, would, was included in their PRG 320 uh, certifications. And in doing so, all of these kind of forces were able to get us a path of compliance for a one-time approval for a project to get built in Miami-Dade County. Why is this important is ultimately because it brought a project to the fore. It brought some questions about policy. It led to some uh, great discussions with the local AHJ. We started to open up their interests in say, how do they build healthier conditions? It has gotten the interest of the local policy um, at, the, at the mayoral level. Uh, so we have been able to talk to them on different um, conditions about what it might mean to introduce a more healthy local regional material for building in Miami or in Florida. And those have all kind of stemmed out of this path of compliance from one little project. And we find that it has a, a small footprint, but a large impact. So I'll kind of, I'm gonna go into that in a second. I wanna talk about two more things though. What's important here is that the team, and I started off this lecture by saying, this is an Atelier May plus Lou Lab combination partnership. And if it wasn't for that partnership, we would have found ourselves unable to kind of address all of the questions along the way. So again, Atelier May and Lou Lab, Woodworks with Products Council, Smart Lamb, uh, NA North America, uh, Britt Peters Associates out of Charlotte was very uh, helpful in this. Both the APA, AWC was great. Hinkle, uh, Hinkle should be noted on here. Um, and as well as the, the local uh, build, building regulations and permitting offices. This is very, very, very critical. But all of this work from the policy side was supported by Wood Innovations Grant from the USDA U.S. Forestry Department, and we have to thank that uh, group for really helping push some of these initiatives forward, both locally uh, for us here in, this, in, in Miami, 
the state, and also the country. I wanna end that first part by saying, all of this work is kind of coming together at the University of Miami in an interesting way. We started off with that grant in 2019 and 2021, which we didn't think a building was gonna come out of it. And just to be very clear, since this is being recorded and maybe played back um, in other conditions, none of the money of the grant went towards the project itself. All of the grant was set up on education, dissemination of education, bringing people together and working on those policy questions. That made possible the building to come together. Now, there's other things that have come up subsequently because of that first grant. We're working with the um, Florida Forest Service, or we have worked with the Florida Forest Service to document this um, project, put it out as a video, which exists on the uh, internet uh, through both our website here at the Lulab and also the Florida Forest Service. Um, we also were able to kind of make some community outreach uh, from that LSR grant. We were able to get an SFI community grant, which brought our students and extended that education into the northern end of Florida, where they were able to go into the woods, see the processing, visit mills, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we were able to get a 2022 Wood Innovation Grant, and where we're linking our work now with the University of Florida and trying to help them bring together what might be a, a wood project uh, for their uh, campus, for the for forestry uh, group on their uh, IFA, within their IFAS uh, community. Uh, we also uh, had two other things come up, which we're very excited about. Uh, we recently received an LSR grant to look at wood utilization networks in Florida, uh, which is to get more of that fiber out of mulch and, and kind of some of the more quickly degradable uh, product bases and into longer term carbon storage mechanisms, um, which has to do with long term viability of wood fiber. And then the most uh, recent grant that we have received and we're beginning work on, uh, we just signed the contract for, which is, again, very, very exciting for us in the state of Florida, is a U.S. endowment for forestry and communities, which is going to find the path for compliance and bring compliance through NOA for SYP-based mass timber um, uh, products, and uh, both of CLT and glue lamp. This is, for us, very exciting. It is not to say that that means that every pro, every mass timber um, element should be used for every building in Miami and, and so forth. But what it is saying is that once we get that NOA, now we can move on to the next set of questions. How do we make this more viable as a building um, approach? And that for us is very exciting. And we're happy to have it housed at the University of Miami School of Architecture uh, at the Lou Lab. All right, so let's get into the project and so you can see a little bit about that, uh, what the output was. Uh, we always present this as a connection between forest, manufacturing, processing, logistics, all the way through a single building. Um, so where, what is the building? It's in uh, Coconut Grove. It, you know, we're, we're within kind of a forest. We have a lot of wood down here. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is, you know, we have wood building processes, but you know, the landscape of us in South Florida is kind of a canopied landscape. It's an urban lot, 50 by 100. It is a residence. Uh, it was our quickest way to get the policy um, people to be comfortable with the scale of the project. So this was a testing grounds. It is a case study. Uh, so it is a, a, a small little structure within Coconut Grove, again, with large impact. Uh, this is roughly the plan. It's a courtyard plan. It takes on some performative criteria in terms of um, thermal transfers, et cetera. And I'll get into that. Here's a section perspective showing the project street on the right-hand side, a series of uh, bedrooms that all point towards the courtyard, a living pavilion and towards the back of the project, which actually has visual connections to the street. And then there's a back garden that does have a pool in it. But one of the things I wanna to point towards, which is the work of the Lulab is not only just to talk about policy stuff, but what we did uh, within the Lulab was we, we put together a manual saying, this is the parts and pieces. This is the procedures. These are all the kind of, you know, taking um, account for all of the, uh, you know, fasteners and uh, straps, et cetera. And we had a in-situ workshop where we handed this stuff out and said, you can watch the project go up and this is what, how it's going to go up. And these are all the parts that are there. Uh, we also were trying to be accountable for all the digital fabrication, which we were uh, guiding uh, within our practice, setting up all of the parts and pieces and helping them work through the files in SmartLAM. Uh, not to say that they can't do it, but we were trying to make sure that all the process was documented and it kind of under an educational approach. Uh, we also manage the kind of information with the crane. Uh, so this is important for mass timber because you do have to pick these large members up. They do have some weight, 
Uh, which brings me to my next point, the bottom right hand side is being accountable for all of the materials that went into this project and their weights for trucking, um, how many trucks were going to be part of this. It's all a carbon question. And then on the left hand side, what are the tools and the techniques and the personnel required uh, for the assembly of these buildings? For us, this is a systems approach. This is a full question, not a singular question of a building and then we wash, we wash our hands and walk away. But from forest, policy, education, assembly, all of it is important for us as a project. So the logistics, um, as we started to do drawings and saying we have a tight urban a lot, we have to put a crane in there, we have to have a semi, these are large mechanisms that have to move this material around. We were like, great, got a great plan in place. This is going to be exciting. We can get the truck in the site. We can get the crane on the site. No issues at all. Um, but of course, nothing ever kind of works out like you want it to. This was actually the logistics. The crane uh, that showed up was a larger crane than expected um, and because sometimes you don't have uh, complete control over all of that. So it went from a 35 a ton crane to a 70 ton crane. That is a massive difference. Uh, the truck driver's skills uh, were such that he could not get the truck into the site and felt comfortable with it on the street. Uh, just we're lucky that the crane driver and the truck driver were able to communicate and get everything positioned where they felt comfortable. But it did require us to kind of block a house. We had to talk to neighbors. Uh, we had to think about those paths of swinging the material. So all of that is something that we were trying to design along the way. And this was a great learning lesson for that. So here's what it looked like on the site. Massive 70 ton crane, uh, a little bitty house, uh, but we're, again, we're learning. Uh, so you can see the um, footprint on the right-hand side. You can see the truck on the left-hand side, um, picking those panels and swinging them into place. Here's the project underway. All the uh, walls are up at this point and the roof panels are going on. Uh, you can see there's a number, there's two people on the roof right now. Uh, one of those is me. Uh, we were very active in the building. We were in, working on the installation of all the CLT, as well as a number of other components in the building system itself. Uh, I want to just talk quickly about some logistical things. I know we're, we're heading towards time. Um, so we have pick points that are important. Uh, this is actually something that engineering might find fascinating is that how we hold those panels actually has longer term ramifications to where they go. And those are also things that need to be designed and understood as panels grow in size, as panels are uh, oriented on the project site versus off of the truck. Those uh, pick points have to be curated in a way that that panel can be positioned, picked up from the truck and positioned uh, on the job site in a way that is uh, useful for installation. So you can see there's multiple ways that they can be handled, uh, but they do have ramifications in terms of the long run of how the aesthetics of a project will turn out. Here you see two different approaches, one of a wall uh, on the right-hand side and one of a, a, a floor panel or a roof panel on the left-hand side. Uh, the roof panel has less concern. Uh, the wall panel is obviously a little bit more problematic. We have limited material to grab onto with the three-ply panel. So we have to be cautious about how we hold it and how the crane grabs, um, grabs onto that panel and moves it around. The other thing that's important for us in South Florida is that because it's digitally fabricated, we have a lot of control over the openings in every cut. So one of the things that uh, you probably are aware is that the NOA for window installation is really tight tolerance. It's much tighter than anywhere else in our country. We have a, a very small um, margin of error between the frame and the opening for NOAs. Uh, the rough opening, you know, we were looking at having it down to, you know, under three eighths of an inch um, around the window. Um, but that also requires us to stay conscious of how the panels are going to be cut. They are milled. Those mills run a round bit, clearly. And those require essentially the bit will only produce an interior radius corners. Those radius corners would conflict with our windows. So we had to work with the manufacturer to get those corners squared so that the window could actually meet the NOA and fit inside of the wall. This is something that seems trivial, but the last thing you wanna do is have those panels come from the factory into site and then have to clean all that up. So we were trying to be ahead of the game and, and checking on all this stuff as we go. Here you see that a little bit more close up in the reality window on the right-hand side, the tight and tolerances of the CLT being down to a 16th means that we can do things like order our windows before we order our CLT, which is actually how we handled this project. Uh, but we have to make sure that we address what was on the left-hand side of the slide, a need for a square interior corner uh, condition. 
the other thing that comes uh, might be interesting for the engineering group is that the panel, even though they have openings, they still require you to leave stiffeners in. And so there's some procedures and processes um, that go into making sure the panel can be picked up off of a truck and slid into the place on the project site and maintain structural integrity. And then those pieces get cut out uh, in the long run. Uh, this is me on the right-hand side doing that. And then uh, you can see on the left-hand side what that looks like when the panels uh, showed up with the stiffeners. And then again, there are electrical outlets that have to be installed, et cetera. This stuff can be milled from the factory uh, and they can have really tight tolerances. But part of our work was to actually educate the local craft. So if you remember back to the, um, if you remember back to the one of the earlier slides, what, what I was talking about was that the singular nature of how the trades have developed because of uh, the hyper-focused on concrete-based systems meant that all of this was foreign and super scary for all of the, the systems people to deal with. And so we had to kind of do a little bit of education on the site, which was fine for us because we're excited about that. But I think as, as the project evolved, people got excited about the, the cleanliness of the craft. And you can see them take pride in some of these, um, some of these outputs. So here's the project as it's going up. I wanted to take this moment just to say that the, the speed of erection for the project was fast. The walls went up in one day. Uh, the roof panels went up in a second day. And then on the third day, uh, the weather resistant barriers were able to be put on. Two weeks later, the windows arrived to, to Port of Miami and they were installed. And so within two weeks, the building went from a slab to a sealed box, essentially ready for the rest of the systems to go into place. So look, we quickly look at uh, technical and tectonics. Um, I just I don't want to dwell on this too long, um, but the wall systems here, uh, we we pushed really hard to make every wall we could CLT, only to stress our knowledge and our practice to say how do we deal with all of the systems. And so we only had three walls that were uh, framed. You can see them in kind of red dash lines, um, and those walls backed up against kitchen and bathrooms and laundry. The systems were a distributed network of systems. We used two condensers that were located on the roof and then a, and four um, really, really small split units that are in uh, that were minimally ducted in the space, meaning that the entire volume was able to be pretty much kept wide open, exposing as much of the CLT as possible, which I'll come to in a second. The other thing that was important is that this uh, blue box, which is located kind of deep into the plan, was the distribution network for the electricity. It came under the slab, into the box, onto the roof, and then it migrates down uh, into the, the, the rest of the house from that roof plane. So the, the systems in the walls that were framed what were intense um, as per usual, um, but you can see on the left-hand side where that box comes in from the meter box for internal house, uh, the electrical comes into that box, it goes up into a switch bank, which is a remote switch bank, meaning that all of the switches in the house that are in CLT are remote switching back to this, communicating back to this box, which gives us freedom and flexibility to move those switches if needed. Uh, but it also allows us to reduce that kind of wiring component um, for uh, the CLT, taking some of that kind of logistical issue off of extra milling, et cetera, from the factory. All of that wire went on top of the roof and then it were fed down uh, specifically to spaces like this. HVAC was fed from the roof in terms of its power. You can see it dangling there. This is a closet wall. So a little bit of furring on the wall, power coming down, feeding to both sides, addressing all of the uh, outlet needs. So none of the outlets and none of the kind of code was sidestepped. Everything was met. The project went through a code as you might expect any project to go through uh, in terms of those basic systems. Uh, and this is kind of the framing that was left over to house some of those units. So uh, we tried to, to make the best out of it, but most of the project was left open and exposed. Now, if we talk about the wall assemblies really quick, and I know we're getting close to time, uh, it's a very basic system, slab on grade with a, a stem, for the most part, kind of turning down when we needed to in terms of a, uh, a CMU to kind of get the building to uh, a bearing condition. All of the uh, wall set on top of that slab came up and had a flat condition, so a butt joint between the mass timber uh, CLT walls and the roof plates. And then we had to go through and layer up other elements. So the building did require from the standpoint of the AHJ to put an inch and a half of insulation on the exterior of the building. 
we feel like that was probably not necessary for the performance of the structure, uh, but they required us to do that. That also then required us to put a couple extra layers on, uh, plywood, furring, et cetera, that wouldn't be needed otherwise. Uh, and then our weather resistant barrier, which is a UV stable membrane, um, wraps the exterior of the entire uh, building. And then we have a perforated aluminum skin that acts as a parasol, uh, trying to protect that building from solar exposure. Uh, the roof, you can see the CLT panel. There is an air gap over the footprint of the house, the kind of heated envelope. Uh, that airspace is where all the power is running. And then there is the insulation that's required to get to R30 above that. And then the, the insulation kind of steps down towards the perimeter, giving a low profile. The exterior envelope looks a little bit like this, mass timber, exterior insulation. There's a number of furring conditions, our perforated metal, and then all the fastening. On the right-hand side, you can see that in axonometric worm's eye view. You can see what that kind of system looks like. And then the image below showing the perforated aluminum skin. Uh, so as we look down the wall, this perforated aluminum skin is actually acting as a, uh, web, a veil for solar exposure, meaning that the pressures of the wall are actually only ambient. Uh, it's not receiving that kind of large solar deposit of energy onto the surface of the skin so that the building is only really negotiating the uh, ambient air temperature as the thermal pressure on the envelope for the walls. Clearly, the roof is not that way, but it means that the walls are not kind of taking on that that large amounts of thermal load. And that has to do with that skin. We do get interesting moments. You know, I, I can't help myself. I am an architect. So kind of the, we're going to head towards the spatial moments in a second, which will be fast. And then we can open up for some quick Q&A. But the, the image on the uh, right-hand side is from the interior looking through window at the end of a, a bath space, which is um, translucent. But we get the, you can see the uh, kind of really interesting shadow effect on the wall. You can see the um, vegetation being kind of projected onto the surface. Uh, and it, it makes for quite interesting space uh, from the inside and from the outside. Uh, if we quickly look at the plan again, I'll just kind of dive in. There is a uh, uh, driveway entrance court. The front door is located there at number four, then at the back side of the courtyard, uh, living, kitchen, and dining. Yeah, sorry, the living room one, dining room two, kitchen three. Uh, kind of all on a stack there that opens up to the rear garden, but also the living room looks towards the street. So we have connectivity. There's a bank of uh, bedrooms that move down the, the west face of the house, which is actually more closed down and doesn't have the same kind of ratio of glass to wall. And then a, a mother-in-law suite. Uh, my mother-in-law lives with us uh, in this particular project. So she has her own area that's uh, only uh, accessible for her. Uh, so the bed, the, the structure is a four bedroom, three bath house on 1800 square feet, uh, again, built for market value. We're not, you know, this is an escalated way out of, out of context because it's a case study. It was a market value uh, project uh, and able to be accomplished in a really short time frame. Uh, CLT panels went up June 14th, 15th and 16th with the weather resistant barrier on the 16th. We moved into the project February 1st. So it's pretty swift, relatively speaking, to Miami-Dade County um, construction processes for residences. I want to say quickly, we looked at some very basic procedures for um, uh, vernacular-based or you know, passive strategies. So we had uh, elevated floor, so it was raised off the ground. The elevation for the building is actually at 13 feet. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot for Miami. Uh, we had a very large roof that was shading most of it through these kind of overhangs and the orientation. Most of the interior space is shaded, I should say. That was a, a study uh, as the building was um, in its early design phases of, of the kind of configuration of roof under, space under roof. We have very large uh, floor to ceiling um, glazing systems, which allow for cross ventilation uh, to happen regularly. Our Wall height is 11.3, which gets back actually to a language of CLT that is essentially based on an 11 foot three panel height. And so that set our wall heights um, and that uh, gives us an additional level of comfort as hot air is able to rise away from the inhabitation of, of humans at the lower level of the, of the space. And then we are working on this lower question, which is uh, something that we'll have to discuss uh, moving forward. So our um, building materials are set up in an assembly, which is pushing them back from water fungus because they're not uh, they're not essentially getting wet 
Um, they're, they're breathable membranes so that the wall stays dry. They're, they are uh, uh, essentially breathing to stay uh, at a moisture content, which is around 13%. And then we do have a, a series of deterrents for insect attack uh, that have to do with flashings and a couple other things. One, visual inspection uh, capabilities. We can see all the foundation. We have removed most of the plantings from the foundation, so there's no way for insects to kind of move around without being seen. And then all the interior uh, space is pretty much accessing um, the mass timber panel, so we're able to visually inspect it constantly. So I'm going to quickly jump into the spatial parameters, and then we'll have some questions. So here's the building from the streetscape. Uh, it, it probably is something that challenges what a house should look like or could look like in Miami-Dade County. The arrival sequence, as you move towards the courtyard, we move into the courtyard. So you can see the front door to the left where that peace lily is at. Um, there's a very large aperture to the sky, which allows light to come into all the spaces, but mainly through indirect conditions. Uh, that tree is kind of filling in now and is starting to help produce some dappled light conditions. But all of the space is really looking towards that courtyard. Uh, everybody has access to views and, and cross ventilation. Uh, in, can, you can kind of see us moving into the courtyard and now standing in one of the circulation porch spaces, if you will. You can see through the back uh, towards the uh, pool and, and garden in the rear of the space. You can see the living room having that kind of large uh, opening for cross ventilation and movement and then back towards the courtyard and that kind of large uh, oculus to the sky in the rear of the house, looking in and through uh, the living pavilion back towards the courtyard. Uh, you can see the shade that's available and we get interesting dapple light that hits the pool and then bounces into the space. Uh, interior of the house, you can see from front to back, uh, the house is very porous and we're able to kind of have eyes on the street and, and this kind of public, but also private conditions quite nice. And then when you're in the living room, looking back towards the, the rest of the house, you can see the kind of porosity and the connectivity. I'm going to end there and say thank you for your time. I thank you for your interest in uh, the project. And I, and I hope that it's helpful to build a larger kind of understanding of where uh, emergent and novel processes are heading, um, particularly their potential usefulness in the state of Florida. Thank you guys for your attendance and interest.